Hi, everybody. Welcome to this edition of your Taking Control of Your Diabetes podcast. I am one of your co-hosts, as always, Dr. Jeremy Pettis, joined by my good friend and colleague, Steve Edelman. And we're joined by a, another special guest to talk about today's topic of telehealth is Dr. Leslie Island, and I'll have her introduce herself. I just wanted to say we're very fortunate to have Leslie here. She flew all the way from Omaha, Nebraska to uh, here to San Diego, filming a number of things for us today. And because she's such an, an expert in telehealth, we're very likely to have her you know, talk to us about it. So Leslie, say hi. Hi, thanks for having me. Anything else you want to tell us about yourself? I am an adult endocrinologist at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and I have a couple other hats uh, at Nebraska Medicine, which is our clinical partner. I'm medical director of patient experience and telehealth. What about this chronic disease you have? I also have type 1 diabetes. There yep. you go. All right, let's start. Uh, Leslie, telehealth means a lot of different things to a lot of people. You ask 10 people, you might get 10 different definitions. What is it? So... Broadly, it's just exchanging medical information from one site to another through some sort of electronic communication to improve somebody's health. Um, and so that can mean a lot of different things. It can mean video visits, like Zoom visits with your healthcare provider. It could mean uh, asynchronous, like uh, secure portal messaging. If your health system has a patient portal, it can even mean phone calls or something like remote patient monitoring, where sometimes patients can get Bluetooth connected, blood pressure cuffs, weight uh, scales, uh, glucometers, and if people are remotely monitoring that data and making decisions off of that, that that's also considered telehealth. Could it be if you're dating your doctor with an online dating service? Is that telehealth? No. <laughs> <laughs> nice try, Steve. Um, so obviously, like this has become almost a household word now because of the pandemic. And people listening are probably thinking, yeah, you know, now I'm, I'm Zooming with my doctor, doing that a lot more. And it was just kind of the way there for a while in the, in the heart of the pandemic. We, we literally could not see people in person. So right. everybody had to run to figure out how to do this, how to, you know, be able to see patients, you know, virtually. And there was some growing pains for sure. But now... It, it's here to stay. You know, it's not going to be the only way we see patients, but it's going to be a part of the way we see patients. But why weren't we doing it prior to the pandemic? Yeah, it, that's a really good question. I mean, it really doesn't have anything to do with the technology. The technology that we use for telehealth is not particularly new or, or nothing really changed in that avenue um, at the beginning of the help, of the public health emergency. It was just strictly like reimbursement. The fact that your insurance company did not consider telehealth, um, that they would not pay as much for a telehealth visit as they would for an in-person visit. And so if you're a big health system, you're not going to invest in, in telehealth for patient care. Um, so prior to COVID, you had to, in order to have a telehealth visit with your patient that your insurance company would pay for, you had to be in a rural area that was identified as a health profession so shortage area. And that visit where the patient was needed to take place in some sort of medical facility, like a hospital or a clinic. So in our program, the University of Nebraska, we go to eight different community hospitals because prior to 2020, that's, that's how we had to do it. You know what? It's just like anything in life. Like look at TCOID, face-to-face -face conferences for 25 years, then came the pandemic. We had to pivot into virtual learning. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, you mentioned something about reimbursement. Unfortunately, it's, sometimes it's all about money. Yeah. So, you know, there's some diseases and some problems that don't lend themselves well to, you know, telehealth visits. And there's some that do. So what do you think about diabetes? Where does it fall on that scale? I think it falls on, you know, it's it's high. It's on one the side of the spectrum with diseases that are very amenable to telehealth. Mm -hmm. And and what are the reasons make diabetes, you know, like a, a, a good thing for telehealth? I suppose. Yeah. So a couple things. There is a shortage of endocrinologists, mm -hmm. and uh, endocrinologists. When when you do have an endocrinologist in your state or in your area, it's probably in an urban area. And so for people who do not live in an urban area. They are often having to take, you know, often a full day off of work or school to make their endocrinology appointment. Um, and that can absolutely be a hardship. And then diabetes itself is a disease um, is very amenable to telehealth because like, rarely is there a physical exam finding that alters your 
decision making, right? I mean, the foot exam is very important and sometimes there are skin issues, um, but usually managing diabetes is getting a history from your patients and learning about how they're doing and what challenges they've had and then just reviewing their data. And so there are multiple ways to get blood sugar data to your provider. Um, you can take a picture of your paper blood sugar log. You can upload your meter and send that as a PDF. And then now there's so much diabetes technology like continuous glucose monitors and insulin pumps that um, connect to a cloud-based system. And your uh, endocrinologist clinic can connect to the cloud and mm -hmm. see all your data almost in real time. You know, it's really true. The physical exam is really not needed in the vast majority of patients. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, sometimes us doctors have to get, are pushed to get the highest level of billing, you do a physical exam, it never really shows anything. I listen to the heart with this test scope around my neck, not in my ears. Yeah, that's not how it's supposed to go. Because <laughs> pe I want people to think that I'm a real doctor. Yeah, and, get but, that. Just and, to clarify, Steve is a real doctor. This is just, you know, a bit of his. And you know what, I mean, but you know, we both, we all learned in medical school, it's all the history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If someone says, yeah, if I step on attack, I scream bloody murder. Those people, we don't worry about foot no. problems. It's just the insensate people. But I'll just say this now, and I'll you know skip it later, but I still like my patients to come in, and we go over the download together and other labs, and I feel the face-to-face -face is important. And I realize in Omaha, you know, there's three or four hours between each gas station and things like that. So, and there's no electric cars there. You told me that earlier that's, today. That's true. And uh, there is practical reasons why it's important. Absolutely. And I think, you know, one thing I mentioned about the physical exam, skin issues, you know, most um, patient portals have a way for you to attach an image. And so I certainly encourage my patients who are having irritation and they're asking me, you know, how to better improve their, their sites or help with the site irritation, they can send me a photo, you know, and I think that's like just as good as, you know, my in-person exam. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, you mentioned, I think it's so important that diabetes lends itself to these, these virtual visits because it's about, you know, seeing the blood sugar numbers and reviewing that with patients, but that hinges on being able to see the blood sugar numbers. And as you mentioned, like prior to the pandemic, that typically mean, meant people physically bringing in their meter or their CGM and we try to find the right plug for it and download it. And to do it properly virtually, you have to be able to get it remotely. And at UCSD, that's taken a while. And I think now we're finally in the place where like with some you know reliability, like I, I will look at their chart and the, the CGM or the whatever will be there, but there's still issues. So what was that curve like for you were you guys kind of already set up to do this, or is that getting better? We were set up to some extent, um, but not very many patients were on our clinic cloud-based portal. Um, and some of that was just re-educating the patients. I think a lot of people just show up to their appointment and hand over their stuff, and they don't want anything to do with it. And so it became a matter of uh, educating and engaging the patients and, and letting them realize like this visit is not going to be helpful really in any way unless you sit down and you know get get connected and sometimes that requires a manual upload where you do have to dig out that cord that initially came with your pump and plug it into a home computer hoping that that you have a home computer um, other times it's just uh, clicking a link in an email to get your app connected to the cloud. Mm -hmm. So um, for some people, it's really challenging and it can be tedious. And so we had to work with our um, medical assistants and our nurse case managers to prep for the visit. And so a day or two prior to the visit in you know, kind of peak times when we weren't seeing anyone in person, um, we were making a list of who we needed to reach out to prior to their appointment and who we needed to walk through the connecting process. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeremy, who is our friend at UCSF? that's head, head of telehealth there. Yeah, Aaron. Um, yeah. Yeah, and remember we talked to him and they had the cameras, the video camera, the screens. They were completely set up and at UC, UC San Diego, God bless them, they tried. It, it, we didn't even have internet coverage in our clinic. Yeah. You know, it was like blocked for some reason. And We're still holding our iPhone like you would on FaceTime. Yeah. You know, so different clinics have different capabilities, but, you know, yeah. we're not dogging on UCSD. It's just, this is how we're still doing it, yeah. you know, with these kind of like. And then you get a resident you're trying to teach. So, like, you have a small phone a and there's other the resident, the patient, and you on the same small screen. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's it's just it's a challenge, and I think there's there's a right way and wrong way to do it. Well, when we were all working together in this way, because we weren't seeing anyone you know, in person, it was going really well. We had a really low no show rate. People were getting uh, what they needed ahead of time. The visits, you know, everything was ready. It was really efficient, but um, that's certainly fallen off now that we're doing this kind of uh, indeterminate hybrid model of telehealth and in-person care and so we don't kind of have that same uh schedule anymore so you're head of telehealth now in omaha mm-hmm. what what does the future hold now it's covid is uh, almost knock on wood <laughs> uh, not giving us too much of a hassle anymore yeah so early on we shifted to telehealth you know primarily for infection control to keep our patients safe especially people with diabetes that are at increased risk for uh, complications from COVID, and we were trying to keep our healthcare providers safe, and we were also trying to limit PPE usage. Right, that was a big thing. We didn't know if we had enough gowns and and masks and and eye shields. And so now the focus is, you know, quite a bit different. I think most people feel pretty safe as long as they're wearing a mask that they can come in and and have a visit with their health provider. And and so the infection risk is not as big. Um, and so now I think people are just finding it convenient Um, and I think it's going to be interesting how it settles out to figure out what percentage of people really still want to continue to utilize telehealth when they're not you know scared of getting COVID at the doctor's office anymore Um, and what does that what does that look like I I think more people are going to go towards some sort of hybrid model where they're either alternate between in-person and telehealth where maybe they do all telehealth except for one visit per year, just sort of have a big comprehensive annual visit where they do get a thorough physical exam and a foot exam and get all of their healthcare maintenance labs that day. Um, And some people just want telehealth as like a a last minute option. I mean, even just a couple weeks ago, I had three patients that were scheduled to see me in clinic that either got COVID or um, their spouse had COVID and they didn't want to take the risk of exposing me and my staff. And so we're just asking to switch last minute to telehealth. And it's really nice to be able to accommodate that um, and and just switch right away. It is really, it's, it's really nice to have it as an option. And I, you know, live in Nebraska where there's a lot of severe weather. And so sometimes if you have somebody that's driving three, four hours for an appointment and the roads are unsafe, it's also nice to be able to offer that to them to keep, keep them safe at home. So what like what kind of numbers are you seeing? So obviously again, height of pandemic, hundred percent of our visits were, were telehealth. Now, you know, if I'm thinking about patients I'd see, I'd say it was about, when, by the way, we give them completely the option, whatever you want to do, you can come in person, you can do it virtually, what do you choose? I would say my patients is maybe like 20% now are doing virtual and 80% like want to come in. Yeah. Is Steve, first of all, you, like, is that about well, what you're I, Well, I have the scheduling folks tell the patient, Dr. Owen prefers face-to-face. Okay. And I'd say... Um, 95 percent face to face okay so you just demand that people kind of demand because i just feel i get much more out of it and i also think it's much better for the the residents and the fellows teaching that they could have them in a room by themselves and absolutely talk to them and what about for you leslie or do you know nationally or anything else like that i i mean i my personal type one clinic that's at the university of nebraska is probably about 20 25 percent um I think as a health system, we're more like 10 to 20% because there's a lot of specialties out there like surgical subspecialties where that's just, it's really hard, hard to do. And Uh they've sort of just gone back to their usual routine. I think um, behavioral health, psychiatry and psychology are, are obviously really up there with probably more than 50% telehealth still in our system. Bariatrics is really high for telehealth, like pre and post-op visits and more uh, medical weight management. They're doing a lot of telehealth. Um, And then endocrine, I think neurology is another specialty that's still hanging out a little bit um, higher than others. And what about, um, you know, the rules about where patients can be when they see you? So, you know, we've been told that patients have to be in the same state, at least, to be able to see us. This, you know, we live in San Diego, so that's not too much of a problem because we don't have, like, neighboring states super close. But what about for you that you might see somebody that's not that actually far from you but is in a different state? How does that work? Yeah, so the visit takes place, um, and this is sort of a a national rule, the visit takes place where the patient is located at the time of the visit. Um, And so I see a lot of people that live in Iowa, and so I'm licensed in both Nebraska and Iowa. Um, Omaha is like right on the Missouri River, so it's right on the border of Nebraska and Iowa. Um, 
And so that has been a challenge for our health system to figure out what percentage um, of a provider's patients are coming from other states and does it make sense to get that provider license so that way they can see their patients via telehealth if that's what the patients want. Um, the provider can be anywhere, actually. Mm -hmm. Oh, well. sure. I mean, I have patients that are, you know, going back to college and asking if they can do Zoom visits from their dorm rooms in Pennsylvania. And like, honestly, I think that would be fine. I've known them for a while. Like, I think I would provide still good care and mm -hmm. it would be continuity of care. And so I'm hoping that that changes, especially if there's a patient that you have a an established relationship with and they're maybe temporarily going to be in another state. It would be nice if that rule was waived. Well, for you, Jeremy and Leslie, where's the strangest place a patient uh, hooked on to a video visit for you? Well, I don't know about strangest, but I've had people multiple times uh, do it while driving. And I'm just like, pull over. You know, like this is something we'll talk about next, that, that people really need to prepare for these visits just like they would a normal visit. And I've had patients do it, you know, in the mall. They're walking around. They're shopping. Um, so, it, it, and that ends up being kind of a waste of a visit because you can't hear them. They haven't been like thinking about the visit. They're not prepared. They're not looking at the labs, et cetera. Um, but the driving one, it was, it was just crazy. Yeah, they honk and you, you son of a bitch. And they, I'm not talking to you, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Someone just cut me off. The, I think the first... Um, like month of the public health emergency, I logged on to see a new patient. Um, and it was, you know, middle of the afternoon in Nebraska. And where he was, was pitch black outside. And I said, you know, where, where are you right now? Are these just like, you know, really good, like blocking shades? And he was in Oman um, and had just, you know, realized, he kind of forgot about the appointment, but then saw it on his calendar and said, I'm just, I have a Zoom link. And he gave me a Dexcom share code and we, had the visit. I don't know if I don't know if that was okay at the no, time. That, well, that's early way on, more okay than Steve's story of like <laughs> <laughs> giving address information to a patient. But, so yeah, more concerning is just people who are not engaged or, or not focused. Like I've yeah. had people who are out yeah. walking around, like apartment hunting, or also you, a lot of cars. Not maybe not driving, but right. actually the car thing could be good. We'll get to that. But um, just I had somebody who was laying on their back in bed with like their hair fanned yeah. out on the pillow and I just was like sit, and so first sit of up, all you know it, sit up and engage with yeah. me you, see I, I'm glad I asked that because I had a, I had patients call me from sitting on a bench outside a liquor store yeah and they're not they weren't drinking alcohol they're waiting for a bus yeah like, so I think serious? you know I it, it does piss us off you know <laughs> like when like it's we want to like we have this time dedicated we want to help these patients and when someone's laying in bed you know it sends a message of this isn't important to me just sit up just sit up yeah. you're, you're, you're right you're right um yeah so you know with that in mind tell us a little bit about like how you have patients prepared for these visits like how you can get the most out of these these visits etc and for you listeners we, we Leslie thought about this ahead of time. We have a laundry list for you. And if uh, for some reason you can't write these down fast enough, you have to listen to the podcast and put it on pause. Yeah, I have a, I have a checklist. I mean, I think you just need to think, what does my provider need for this visit to go smoothly and for me to get the most out of this visit. So you want to make sure your technology works. You should test your audio, test your video, decide are you going to be on your phone? Are you going to be on a tablet? Are you going to be on a laptop or a desktop? I really like when people use a laptop and a desktop if that's something they have because I like to share my screen to show them like if they're on a CGM, their ambulatory glucose profile and be able to point out patterns and why I'm doing or why I'm recommending the changes that I'm recommending. And you can't share your screen on, I mean, you can when someone's using their phone, but it's just not, not as good. So I like people to use bigger screens if, if that's possible. Um, I think it's helpful to reach out and see if you need any lab work prior, especially if that lab work's going to affect some of your recommendations. Um, and it's helpful to figure out how your provider is going to access your glucose data. And if you're already connected to the clinic portal, great. But it doesn't hurt just to send a message to say, anything else I need to do before my appointment? Can you make sure you can see my data? Um, can I ask about the labs real quick? Yeah. Because, you know, what do you, how do you do it if someone's, yeah, 100 miles away from you or whatever, and they want to use a lab that isn't necessarily in your system? Like, do you fax them, like, you know, orders to go to a local lab and they have to kind of like fax that back? Or how do you do that? Yeah. So I try to be proactive about it in the visit before I anticipate what they're going to need and then mail them like paper lab orders if they live far away. So if, it, if there's enough time, I will mail them 
external paper lab orders. Um, if there's not enough time, we will figure out the name of their local lab that they want to go to and fax those orders directly to the lab. And usually the lab is good about faxing me the results back within, if it's kind of standard diabetes labs, within a day or two, most of those mm -hmm. labs are done in-house. And then we manually enter them into our system. Um, so but it, it takes some planning. It for takes sure. some planning. And ideally, you know, a few days to a week before it would be nice just mm -hmm. to, to make sure that's all done. Just real quickly, Jeremy, in our clinic at UCSD, each patient who's on a CGM gives some type of code and password to our staff. Yep. And that is, then that's just, that's done. That's, yeah. that's permanent. You don't have to do that again. Yeah. That's, um, and you might, for the listeners, you might ask if, if the clinic you go to has that capability. Yep. They absolutely should. Yeah, that's actually a pretty easy process. Oh, it goes right into the electronic yeah. medical record. It's sitting right there. Mm -hmm. I have run into a few issues with people who are utilizing um, the Tandem app, the T-Connect app, yeah. because if you just open the app, um, there's no data initially. Like you, A lot of people may not have the app open, and you have to open the app for like one, if not two days, for all of your, your data to get mm -hmm. populated. So if you open up the app just minutes before your appointment, your provider will not see any data. You have to plan ahead for that. Yeah, that, that is so important. No data, no visit. Right. Yeah. But right. you still get billed. You know, I tell people it's like going to see your accountant. You know, you, you would never show up to someone and say, do my taxes with like no information. Right. Yeah. You just, know? you know, if you have questions, write those out ahead of time. Um, if you need refills, you know, send a message or just be prepared to uh, mention that at the beginning. Just yeah. plan ahead. What about day of? Um, so you want to sit up as, as i've mentioned before and just you know i think decent lighting would be helpful just so just so we can feel like we're having you know something that's as close to a an in-person visit mm -hmm. um if you have you know children or people that are you know also in in your space i would just try to figure out how to have a you know minimum number of distractions yeah. i mean I, you know, usually just yeah. give your children a tablet or i or love something. seeing kids they're so cute but you know they get they can get disruptive i would say you know like the, the lighting thing like it, it actually can be nice to see <clears throat> into the person's like home yeah sure you know it gives you a little insight into like okay like you know like it, it can have some intimacy to it and that is a, a positive of these visits sometimes absolutely um, so fewer distractions, the fewer distractions, the better. And then I also think it's helpful to figure out, um, you know, when figure out follow up, sometimes the clinic, um, will call you back to schedule a follow up. Sometimes the expectation is that you call clinic to schedule a follow up and you should be prepared to tell them what type of follow-up visit do you want? Do you want another mm -hmm. telehealth visit? Do you want to come in person? Just plan that out because I think some providers have separate clinic slots for like this is their telehealth day and time and this is their in-person day and time. That's not a small thing because it just creates confusion and phone calls later on if you don't have it set when they leave the room. Yeah. yeah. So. I think for me that's like the one, the, the major thing missing or that I don't like about the telehealth visits is that usually when I'm done with a patient in person, there's a lot of stuff that happens afterwards. Right. Like, hey, walk with me to the nurse's station. Over here is like the schedulers for your follow-up. You know, maybe there's a, a nurse here that's going to train you on this new injection, which is something else we can talk about, right. how to remotely do all that. Um, so it, it requires more planning, and it can be done, but it's just, like you said, like, okay, how am I doing follow-up? How am I getting, you know, like, you know, next, you know, labs um, trained on this new medication, et cetera? And, and then... I, excuse me, Alyssa. Yeah, I was going to say there's not a single injection that we ask our patients to do, whether it's a GLP-1 or insulin or starting a sensor is not a good YouTube video. Right. And, or and, utilizing like your local pharmacist for injection treatment, I think I've, I've used as well. Um, one challenging thing is if I'm making changes to CGM alerts or recommending changes to pump settings is that, you know, I want to feel confident that my patient who I'm not seeing in person is going to be able to to make those changes um, safely. And so I just want people to be honest with me about what they're confident uh, about, you know, their confidence and their ability to do those things. And if they need help, then fine, I can arrange for an additional phone call or Zoom visit with one of our educators to walk them through um, all of those steps. Yeah, you know, another thing 
if you want to talk about it now, that like a, a movement that is potentially happening is because we have this telehealth is these kind of, I don't know if you call them third party, but kind of like, you know, diabetes management, you know, entities that could be companies um, that are looking to manage, you know, large numbers of people with diabetes. So what we've been talking about so far is, is more of your classic kind of doctor visit. But how do you feel about this going, you know, being scalable, I suppose? Yeah, I think they can be done well and they can be done not well. Um, a big challenge is just uh, working with somebody's primary care doctor and many of these sort of virtual clinics don't have um, kind of systems or portals that work with other electronic health records and so it's just a challenge to figure out where that data lives, how to get the data when somebody has you know, a primary care doctor and an endocrinologist that may be um, overlapping a lot. Yeah, Jeremy. You know, you didn't ask me, but I can put my two cents in. You know, I'm Steve. Can I? I wanted to ask you, what do you th- what do you think <laughs> yeah, about this? I'm not a big believer in those mm. because I think you don't know how educated the person is about diabetes talking to your patient. Sometimes they can't even make suggestions, and all it does is put confusion in the patient's mind. And so I, I am really not up for that personally. Got it. So, um, and then anything else you wanted to talk about, Leslie? I know you were talking about reimbursement. Is that something you wanted to get into? Uh, well, I think, you know, it's helpful. A lot of a lot of times when you have a doctor's visit, you get a survey at the end. And, um, uh, you know, a few days later, they want you to fill out a survey over email. Um, and it's just important to, like, talk about your experience around telehealth. Mention, you know, people actually do read those surveys and read your responses. And if you like telehealth and want to keep seeing your provider over telehealth, I think it's important to to let them know that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, some private insurance companies are starting to cut reimbursement for telehealth, which I think is um, concerning and could lead to health systems not investing in telehealth anymore. And so if your state um, does not have payment parity for telehealth, I think that's something um, important to advocate for. Yeah. Well, Leslie, I um, want to thank you for coming all the way to San Diego for this podcast. And just to let you know, Eric, our podcast guru, can even mail you a podcast mic, and we can do telepodcasting the next time we have you on. Well, I got to say, I we've done that. some some Zoom recorded video lectures with Leslie, and her setup always looks the best. So you've kind <laughs> of like locked this in with the lighting, and so you practice what you preach. So thanks for that. And Eric, our producer and director... Uh, agrees with that so thank you so much for being here leslie leslie's been here for two days now we really enjoyed it um and uh thanks everybody for listening thanks Thanks. leslie